This video introduces the basics of Egyptian pictorial art, that's to say, Egyptian two-dimensional art, without going into an in-depth analysis of any one particular work. We'll remember that in addition to painting, drawing, and so forth, pictorial art can refer to low-relief sculpture, especially if it is very flat. However, even high-relief sculpture often has some pictorial elements. This is because the artist is still working on some kind of flat surface. I should also note that Egyptian sculpture, like all sculpture in ancient times, was typically painted. This video focuses on how ancient Egyptian artists represented human figures, which exist of course in three dimensions, on a flat surface. Since ancient Egyptian pictorial art, which emerged shortly before 3000 BC, represents one of the earliest transitions from prehistoric to historic ancient art, the ancient Egyptian artists were among the first to take up the challenge of representing figures in space. Of course, the challenge in all representational two-dimensional art is to render a real-life three-dimensional object on a flat surface. Artists have long since discovered that to achieve a sense of mass, or the bulk of 3D objects, they might use light and dark to suggest the highlighting and shadows that define a surface. And to achieve a sense of space, an artist might use perspective, overlapping, and foreshortening, among other techniques. The ancient Egyptians, however, never discovered these techniques for imbuing their figures with volume or their scenes with naturalistic space, and instead used a simpler system for representation. Before I describe this, I would note that just because art is representational, it doesn't necessarily mean that it requires a high level of naturalism, especially if the goal is merely to render identifiable objects or an identifiable narrative. Even a stick figure might achieve this aim. But as we move out of the prehistoric era, the rudimentary depictions of figures, animals, and so forth were abandoned in favor of more convincing representations with more details. In fact, including more anatomical details in a figure is the first step towards naturalism. The second is putting these details together in a way that is accurate with regard to scale or proportions. Early on, the Egyptians used overlapping and ground lines, which both suggested a notion of place and space. However, aspects of their art remained highly conceptual. What I mean by conceptual is that it was an idea of the mind, rather than an observation of the eye, which would be perceptual. We could start with the ground line itself as an example of a conceptual approach. For, although a ground line is indeed a stabilizing element that immediately anchors the figure on a flat horizontal surface in our minds, the ground actually never appears to our eyes as a straight line directly under a person's feet in real life, unless maybe they're walking on a balance beam. If we zoom in on the feet, we should find another flaw with this perfectly straight, single ground line. If you stand in striding motion, is one foot exactly in front of the other? Of course not. And so, if you were to photograph a figure from the side, you would see the small space between the feet, indicating that one is farther from you than the other. In fact, you would see this space in the photograph of an Egyptian statue, which is an inherently 3D object, and didn't require artists to figure out how to render space. Technically, you might say a realistic sense of space always generates two ground lines for the feet of a figure in profile, although we can understand how this space might be pictorially elided into a single thick ground line that both feet stand on. Even so, it really does require a conceptual rather than a perceptual approach to stick one foot directly in front of the other. The ancient Egyptian combination of a perceptual and conceptual approach runs throughout the portrayal of figures, not just the feet. Egyptians rendered their figures in a composite view. That's to say, while obviously the representation is derived in part from observation, the artists did not render the figure exactly as seen. Instead, they assembled what they knew about the human figure in a way that it could never be perceived at one moment in time. 
The view is called composite or mixed because we are seeing the figure from different sides at the same time. In fact, these artists, not unlike their prehistoric forebears had done in a more primitive way, captured the most characteristic aspects of a figure. The broad shoulders and chest are thus seen in frontal view, but then the body twists unnaturally at the neck so that the head is seen in profile, and even more unnaturally at the waist so that the legs and those feet are seen in profile. Think of how difficult it would be to capture the essence of a foot from a frontal position. If you look carefully, you'll notice that, although the head is in profile view, the eye is frontal. Again, because that is the most characteristic view of the eye. Conceptually, it makes perfect sense. Without training, few would figure out how to draw an eye from the side. And in part, this is because, as children, we rarely start drawing after close observation of an object, but instead, based on what we know from what we've seen all along. Fingers may certainly bend to hold things or for other expressive purposes, but neutral hands adhere so strongly to a prototype, almost like a stamp, that there are those awkward moments when one of the thumbs is facing the wrong direction, making the hand look like it was attached backwards. Our female figure here reveals another strange assemblage of forms. What we observe in most Egyptian pictorial art, where women are clothed, is that one breast projects out from the body in the direction the woman is facing. From that, although the breast on the other side is not depicted, we strongly infer its presence on the forward-facing part of the chest. And yet, it is never actually drawn in that position. In fact, when the woman is topless, the breast generally appears to be in profile, analogous to the composite view of the frontal eye on the profile head. A similar convention exists for male figures whose nipples are portrayed on only one side of the body. Egyptian pictorial art is conceptual in other ways that I'll discuss, but the very word conceptual, being of the mind, might also suggest a sense of rationality and order, and certainly the Egyptian pictorial order is easy to grasp, despite operating on a logic counter to a photorealistic one. This is probably because our human minds continually process and organize what we observe. Abstract thinking is one of the defining traits of our species. The logic of Egyptian art endured for almost 3,000 years until the Roman conquest in 31 BC. Egyptian culture was extremely conservative, especially with regard to art. This is probably because art was most prominently associated with spiritual rituals. Most of what has survived was found in tombs or temples, and the images had mystical properties, almost like a painting springing to life, or the words from the page of a book doing the same. Yet, for all this mystical life, Egyptian art, though legible, often looks rigid, stilted, and formulaic throughout its long history. In fact, the composite view was a formula, or pictorial convention, even the proportions of the figures were predetermined for ease of reproducing a figure in any context or at any scale. An expert artist was one who had mastered the pictorial conventions that the powerful wealthy patrons, namely the royal family and the priests, came to expect. Besides the composite view, I mentioned the ground line, which, though not strictly naturalistic, gives the work a sense of order. Sometimes the ground line is used to divide a surface into registers, with each scene unfolding in a distinctly delineated space. This is a formula used in much ancient art, and we continue to do something similar today in comic books and graphic novels. Other times, figures occupying the same space may have their own independent ground line. On the one hand, our intuition may suggest that the smaller figure represents a kind of diminution as he moves back further in space. On the other hand, 
We know from multiple examples, including those where figures of different sizes occupy the same ground line, that Egyptians used hieratic scaling. That's to say, the most important figures, like the pharaoh most notably, were rendered at a much larger scale than the common people who might be at his service. A dramatic but illuminating example on the interplay between independent ground lines and space occurs in this reproduction of a now-destroyed wall painting dating to the Middle Kingdom. It depicts workers transporting a large statue. At the very first glance, the figures seem to be disposed in completely independent registers. Then we realize they are all pulling this enormous statue. And yet, the bands of figures look stacked upon each other, as if they are each pulling the heavy statue forward at different heights. A closer look reveals that the ropes they pull are all tied to the same point at the base. Thus, we understand that these are meant to be rows of paired workers standing all together on a flat ground, with one pair standing to the side of another pair, as well as in front of one. Since the artist has used overlapping for the pairs that are close together, it makes the stacked view, which should be perspectival, more difficult to grasp at first glance. It only makes sense conceptually. On the other hand, if a perspectival view with more overlapping was used in this image, do you think it would convey the same sense of numbers? The repetition of a similar motif strongly suggests the multiplication of men. If you look at the image in its entirety, do you spot another convention? The ever-present hieratic scaling is used, where the overseers on the left are depicted larger than the menial workers. In certain artwork, both fully sculptural and two-dimensional, conventional use of color appears as well. Men are portrayed with red-brown skin, a mahogany hue, and women's skin has a more distinctly yellowish ochre hue. Furthermore, whereas men typically wear a kilt and are bare-chested, women wear long, semi-transparent dresses that cling to the body. Accordingly, the legs are closer together. As noted, one breast projects forward, whereas the other breast is not rendered at all. Skin color also indicated ethnic distinctions in Egyptian art. As a center of civilization, Egypt was a melting pot for its neighbors on all sides, but this image shows the most common Egyptian type at the far left. Finally, it's important to mention that Egyptian art is replete with symbols, and like graphic novels, is often accompanied by writing, or rather, an ever-advancing system of writing known as hieroglyphics. Because the hieroglyphs themselves include pictures, they often seem to belong to the pictorial field, and at the purely visual level, it's hard to separate representative imagery from words. As noted, the words are just as much a mystical and symbolic part of the content as the representational images, both being innately tied to Egyptian religious beliefs. In a tomb, for example, the walls might be decorated with spells that would help the deceased accede to the afterlife. Symbolism further figures into works since the pharaoh, or ancient Egyptian king, doubled as a god and achieved political and secular triumphs by the intervention of the gods who appear abundantly in these tomb and temple settings. Falcon-headed Horus appears frequently with the pharaoh as the god of sky and kingship. Pharaoh is recognizable by his false beard, which alludes to Osiris, god of fertility and the afterlife, among other things, who was himself depicted with a beard green skin, and shrouded like a mummy from the waist down, due to the fact he was killed and resurrected. Jackal-headed Anubis was the predominant god of death before Osiris came to the fore. He is depicted black, like the rich silt of the Nile that fertilized the earth when the river annually flooded the lands and allowed for agriculture in an otherwise desert setting. In some contexts, Pharaoh wears a crown that combines the white crown of Upper Egypt 
with the red crown of Lower Egypt associated with the cobra goddess of that region. The combination of these two crowns is a symbol of unification. The pharaoh, or certain gods, are often depicted holding several other symbolic items. The flagellum, evoking both an agricultural tool and a whip, represents sovereignty. The heka, evoking a shepherd's staff, symbolizes Pharaoh's guidance of his flock or his people. The wa scepter, evoking a stick used to catch snakes, is a sign of power and dominance. The ankh cross, probably the best known symbol, meaning life, symbolizes immortality and eternity. As conservative as Egyptian art was, we cannot expect it to look exactly the same for 3,000 years, although there is certainly a stylistic cohesiveness that makes Egyptian art immediately recognizable. Experts will know the difference between Old Kingdom, Middle Kingdom, and New Kingdom art, as well as other special periods like the famous Amarna period of the mid-1300s BC during the New Kingdom. There are many examples of vivacity in Egyptian art, and there are even examples of simple landscape backgrounds or figures in motion that break the rules in a manner of speaking. But since this is just the basics, if you remember the Egyptians' enduring pictorial conventions regarding the composite view, hieratic scaling, and conceptual ways of showing space, you'll have the foundational springboard for exploring Egyptian pictorial arts, wall painting and relief sculpture in more depth and at more leisure. Happy exploring!